Now, in addition to programming and automation solutions, students also learn to develop solutions requiring information. We frame these as information solutions. And there are a range of different aspects of this. And the first of these is data acquisition, how we actually acquire data and put it into our digital systems. Now, fundamentally, this is taught with the mathematics um, unit in statistics, where students are learning how to collect information, collect data, and create um, calculations on that data, uh, creating graphs, things of that nature. So there are a range of aspects, though, that relate to digital technologies. Um, so the f in the earliest years, students are looking more at categorizing data. Um, the fact that we have different things that we can label as um, big or small, green or red, and we can count the numbers of those, and we can make tallies of these. How many red objects do we have? How many blue objects do we have? This is data, this is data collection. We may go out into the yard and collect a whole lot of leaves. How many of the leaves are green? How many are brown? How many are shaped in different ways? Um, these are ways that we can explore data and um, collect that sort of data. Now, as we progress up into the years, into years three and four, we start looking at more purposeful uses of data. Although some of this can occur in the early years as well. Um, for example, students might go around and look at the different types of rubbish that exist in the yard. How in some places it's more food waste, in others it might be paper, in others it might be um, metal cans or other things. And they can collect that information, which can then later be used in other aspects that we'll be talking about. This can also be done through collecting surveys. Um, the students might create a survey of the pets that other students have or the favorite foods. Um, in terms of a project, they might then explore what sort of foods could be sold at the tuck shop. And they could do a survey as what foods students would like to have um, available. So these are the sorts of aspects that students will engage with in acquiring data. Now, once they have the data, they can then do various ways of representing that data, uh, producing simple graphs or collections, um, how many blue marbles versus how many red marbles, how many green marbles, and visually see the differences between the numbers. Um, and as their mathematical literacy improves, we can then start doing calculations on that, um, adding up the number of um, different fruits that students have in their for their lunches. Um, in later years, we can then do more complex calculations, such as doing averages uh, and things of that nature. But to start with, we'll tend to use um, pictographs and simple images. Um, a simple graphing of the weather each week and we put up little sun symbols or rainy cloud symbols or um, wind symbols, and we can sort of progressively see how the weather has changed over the week by collecting data about weather. So in years three and four, we really start getting into graphing this sort of data um, using various bar graphs and pie graphs and, and exploring how we can visualize that data in different ways. But we're still focusing on, in this section, on the acquisition of data, um, gathering various data that we can then use for various purposes. Of course, remember, digital technologies and technologies as a learning area is all about solving problems. So if we have a problem, let's say there might be some accidents occurring at the um, drop-off point, um, at the school drop-off at the front of the school. Part of investigating that problem may be collecting some data. 
um, finding out how many students travel to school by car versus by bus versus by uh, bike or walking and using that to get an understanding of how much of our school traffic is occurring with cars. Um, part of then the solution might be to have more buses or better bus routes. Part of the solution might be to encourage bicycle riding by having um, uh, bicycle trains where they go around the, su the suburbs and students join along onto the end of the bicycle train and an adult, an adult goes with them and they get to school that way. There are other possible solutions to reducing the accidents occurring by reducing the number of cars. There may be other solutions as well that students could explore, but gathering data is often the first step in coming up with these solutions. Now, in older years, we can then start looking at automatic data collection. And one of the activities you'll be doing in the workshop is looking at programming a device to automatically capture data. In this case, it'll be capturing soil moisture um, using a small device that will record that moisture level. And so over each hour, it records the amount of moisture and we can then get a picture over time of what's occurring with the moisture levels for a plant and then when it should be watered and most efficiently um, looked after so that it grows and is healthy and flourishes. But there are many other forms of automatic data collection that students could um, look at. Uh, collecting temperature data so that they could see over um, the year how the temperature changes with the seasonal changes. They could look at um, sun intensity as to when it is safe or not safe to go outside without wearing their hats in terms of UV exposure. So there's lots of different ways automatic data collection can be useful. Now it's most often used in science, around science experiments, looking at um, data, um, data logging, as it's called, uh, and collecting um, data samples over a period of time instead of having to go out and measure something um, when we want to take interval data. So that's the processes around data acquisition and data logging as a particular technology that can be used to assist in this. But there are a range of other concepts you'd also need to teach your students about in terms of data. Now, one of these is the difference between digital data and analog data. When we take a temperature reading, it is often analog. Um, it's a measure of temperature, often by the height of mercury in a little thermometer. And it's not digital. It's not zeros and ones. Now, we do have digital thermometers, um, which can be used for zeros and ones. But a lot of the digital data we work with has what are called discrete intervals. It's either on or off. Um, and it records data in binary. So students understanding this concept of binary and binary code. And the result of that is that we can transmit data more reliably. When we have analog data, there's always a margin of error in our taking of our measurements and also in transmitting that data. Of course, we don't have a specific value that is um, clearly defined enough that it will never change in translation. Um, the old activity where you, um, Chinese whispers, where you whisper a message and you pass on that message from student to student and then try to interpret that message at the end is a good example of analog data. It becomes distorted over time. Each transmission of the data, of course, there's a small possibility of, of modification um, if there's enough different transmissions, it will eventually be corrupted and become distorted. So if you've ever listened to an old analog um, audio tape or video recording um, using tape rather than CD or DVD, which are digital, you'll see that over time they degrade. Whereas digital material doesn't degrade. Or if it does, it either stops working completely or it continues at the same level of quality. Now, one of the reasons why that happens 
is that it's made up of those zeros and ones and we have um, what are called check bits that determine whether or not that sequence of zeros and ones has changed or not. And if they have, then we request the information again or we know that the data is corrupted. Um, that doesn't occur with analog data. Another important aspect of digital data is that it can be compressed. Now you've all heard of compression, um, taking photographs and zipping them and uh, being able to transmit them and store them on a small amount of space on your computer and so forth. And there's a particular way that happens. And it's quite simple. And there's a little video clip showing you that process that you can use to explain and explore with your students. It's simply taking um, known bits of that data, giving them a different label, and then deleting um, that sequence and just recording the new symbol that represents a longer sequence. And if we do that enough times, we then end up with a series of these new symbols. And if we know what those symbols mean, so for example, a symbol might mean the word thou, and another symbol might mean the word um, repeat. So instead of having to store the word thou or the word repeat, which might involve five or six characters, we have two symbols that involve just one character each. One that represents thou and one that represents repeat. And so by doing that over a number of iterations, we can get down to much smaller amounts of information that needs to be stored and transmitted. Um, as long as we know the code key to decrypt the information. That's why when you unzip and zip files, it goes through that process. And that's called data compression. 